I'm John Biggs with TechCrunch. Um, I've been writing about Bitcoin for a couple of years now. Uh, I have a, I have a very, I, I used to have a miner under my desk. It was, I was getting at least 25 cents a month, <laughs> which I guess kind of is a, is a conflict of interest here, but it's, uh, it's something that I'm, I feel I need to do to really to worry about my kids' education and future uh, <laughs> safety. Uh, that said, I know some of these guys, but why don't you introduce yourself, Michael? Right, uh, Michael Casey, Wall Street Journal. I'm a columnist. Uh, Bitcoin is kind of my nighttime job. My, my day job is really looking after, uh, look, writing about uh, global finance <coughs> and currencies generally. Uh, I am the author of, um, you're going to hear this pitch all night, I'm sorry, The Age of Cryptocurrency. I do apologize, we did hope to actually sell books here. <coughs> logistics were such that we couldn't. Nonetheless, I encourage you all to buy it afterwards. And those of you who did, did bring it along, happy to sign it. But um, that's me and my sales pitch, uh, Joel. Hey, so my name is Joel Monegro. I'm on the investment team of Union Square Ventures, and we're a venture capital firm here in New York City. Uh, we've been around for 11 years now. This is our 11th year, and we traditionally invested in companies like Twitter, Foursquare, Etsy, etc. And more recently, we've been looking at Bitcoin as something that fits into a thesis of large networks of engaged users. And as a result, we've been, we're series A investors in Coinbase and also in OneName more recently, and have been looking at, at blockchain applications more aggressively lately. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Sonnenschein. Uh, I'm the Director of Sales and Business Development at the Bitcoin Investment Trust. Uh, we're one of the first investment vehicles that was launched uh, to allow people to get exposure to Bitcoin uh, through a titled and familiar investment vehicle. Uh, it was you know, birthed out of Second Market, which is a broker dealer based here in New York. And uh, now we are repackaging all of our Bitcoin activities um, on the investing side, on the asset management side, under a new company called Digital Currency Group. Uh, and you'll continue to see a couple of uh, other announcements from us. Uh, but I'm a former banker, uh, did a tour of duty kind of across the street, and about a year and a half ago decided to uh, give up Wall Street and uh, try this Bitcoin thing. So uh, that's why I'm here. All right, so before we start, let's, let's get a, sh so who's a VC here? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody? All right, so they just these guys, okay. And we're all aware of well, Bitcoin. We know what it is, we're okay with it, we're accepting of it. We, we have a few, yes? Raise your hand if you have some. Look at this, this is, this is beautiful, it's beautiful. Uh, we don't need to go into too much detail, yes? Unless there's one person we could take outside for a little bit and then bring him back in and <laughs> make an educational situation. All right, good. So I think the most interesting thing we could talk about, let's start with you, Michael, because you have, you have your book, which is pretty fancy, uh, but it's also <laughs> extra fancy because now it's on, the, it's on the blockchain, right? That's right. Yeah, so tell actually. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, so, so it was great to, to see the presentation from, from Monograph because it really dovetails with what, what we did. And it, look, we, we embedded the book into the blockchain, uh, took a hash of, of the full PDF of the book, uh, and then in a transaction just um, uh, one week ago from today, in fact, Ben here from the Bitcoin Center is, was, was there at the time, uh, the folks at the Digital uh, Currency Council did it for us. So what, what's that, what, why did we do it? Uh, largely as an act of demonstration, we, we, we have copyright in this, and so no one can really take that away from us, but, but to, make, to make a point, and the point is that uh, the, the blockchain is an irrefutable record. Um, it, 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 is, and it is something that, that sort of can't be taken away. I mean, the, the, go into a big debate about what might happen to the blockchain in sort of a, a most drastic quantum computing world, but other than that, there's this, this notion that it cannot be, it cannot be hacked, it cannot be uh, uh, refuted because we have the consensus system behind it. So a transaction on the blockchain that embeds something like this says at this particular time, uh, those who, who put that transaction in there are claiming copyright for this. So we have this book, our book now, registered um, for eternity uh, on this date. And the thing that struck me about it was, again, something that I, I would use as a, as a talking point more than anything else, not because I think that um, at, you know, I, I'm going to come into some legal challenge one day. But my, the first book I wrote was a book about the image of Che Guevara. Uh, you probably know the famous photo by Alberto Corda of, of, of Ernesto Che Guevara. Uh, it's the most reproduced photo in the world. 
and uh, it, it, it is, and the, and the reproduction of it is not in the classic sense of what we think about it as a photograph. It is, I, mean, I, think the, I think the literally most reproduced print of a photograph is the one of Marilyn Monroe, and that's the same photo every time. Che's photo is reproduced in multiple derivative works. Actually, I see Joe Lubin over there, who I think first put me on the idea of why this was an interesting idea. Um, and uh, derivatives, derivative works becomes a really challenging issue for artists, and you know, we, I don't want to repeat what we just heard about monograph, but if you think about something like the image of Che, where you have the photo, and then you have somebody who does the very first uh, silk screams, a guy called Jim Fitzpatrick in, in Ireland, and then all the multiple uses that get put on hats and surfboards and everything else, and obviously anarchists and actually neo-Nazis as well, believe it or not, uh, a, a full range of people using this thing. There's, there's claims that can be made all along through history saying, I have a right to this work, but you're ultimately going to have to trace the ultimate you know, right to it to, to the photographer at the very beginning. Imagine building a contract that would automatically pay out to all of the parties along the line a portion according to whatever it was in an automated way. That's a very empowering thing for an artist to have. And as, as, as we heard, it's a... Uh, it's very hard to make money in, a, in, a, in an internet world that is replicating things automatically. So to me, this is a really one of the very many exciting opportunities. I mean, it, it's got to be, uh, you know, the tires have to be kicked on this and it's going to have to get worked out properly in, in, a, in a functional manner. But it, it's just, it's just it, it speaks to this idea of irrefutability that, that, that it is, um, and the time stamping element of it that just says, now in history this was done. I think that's a very powerful idea. Okay, so that addresses that addresses what we artists uh, like about the blockchain. <laughs> you and I are men of the, men yes. of the pen. Indeed. Uh, what do you guys like about it? You've been you've been investing in this for a couple years now. What first drew drew? It doesn't have to be you specifically, or just drew the firms uh, themselves to the blockchain. Uh, I guess Michael, if you wanted to start, you could talk a little about Barry and those guys. Sure. This uh, is so. Let's, let's go to the past, and then we're going to go to the future. And then into the far future where dinosaurs come back. Sure. So um, I, uh, I work under a gentleman named Barry Silbert, um, who's a pretty well-known name in the Bitcoin space. If you don't know him, Google him. Barry now is a, a pretty prolific angel investor and has put money into about 45 different Bitcoin companies. And what really drew me to Barry and the opportunity to work with him, and um, I don't work as much on the investing side and deploying money into Bitcoin companies. My focus is more on our investment vehicle. Um, but the thesis is about bringing Bitcoin, you know, to the world. And, you know, so many people are looking at Bitcoin for the potential it has in the remittance and payment spaces, um, you know, other things mentioned such as smart contracts. I mean, truthfully, the, the possibilities of using consensus networks and, and decentralized protocols um, are really and truly endless. Um, I think for me personally, though, I got really excited about it, uh, having come from a Wall Street background. Um, and no offense to anybody in this room or the companies you may work for or with, but when I would sit in a seat and have to buy a foreign currency and then wait two days for it to settle and then wire it through an intermediary bank and then you know, email the person in Europe and say, did you get my wire? And when you think back at you know, the amount of time, the amount of um, you know, money that is spent on just a simple procedure, um, such as sending money someplace. You know, we all use Twitter, we all use email. Information is disseminated virtually, instantly, and everywhere, um, and for free in, in most most cases. You know, why shouldn't money be the exact same way? Um, and Bitcoin, I think, can be the rails that propels a lot of this innovation and change. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I'm so excited about it. So um, I guess I would start with that. Uh, in our case, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, what we really invest in our investment thesis is centered around networks and uh, large networks of engaged users that are differentiated through user experience and defensible through network effects. So uh, the first investment in this space that we made uh, a couple years ago was Coinbase. And back then we were interested in, in, in this idea of, of an economic layer for the internet and per permissionless access to finance and money and um, all the features of Bitcoin that we understand and, and know very well. Um, but lately we've been realizing that um, just as you can say that money makes the world go around, perhaps you can say that Bitcoin will make the internet go around. And 
also we've been realizing that what it's the blockchain in itself, this permanent record of information, can be used to build decentralized protocols like OpenAIM, like Monograph, etc. And these decentralized protocols, what will enable is the unbundling of applications of the applications that we have today. So the theory behind it, or the thesis behind it rather, is for example, open name, one name with the opening protocol is unbundling identity from these centralized services that you know we've spent the past 10 years investing in and everyone, um, and these services that you know were very disruptive in their early stages are now, have now become the new bundle. So YouTube unbundled television and now YouTube is the new bundle of video. And you know Twitter unbundled media and now Twitter is in a way a new media bundle and so on and so forth. And you know, it, it was Jim Barksdale who said that businesses move, or the industries move in cycles of bundling and unbundling, and each cycle is marked by one major technological revolution. And perhaps what drove the unbundling of the previous bundles was the internet, and Bitcoin will uh, enable the unbundling of the new bundles. Uh, and that that's uh, that's the theory or the thesis that we've been developing, and it's really exciting to think about uh, the future of businesses, what it means to consumers to have uh, unbundled applications where your identity is not tied to an, in, to an individual service, rather it's tied to, a, to an independent network. And so in the same thing you can say for art or you can say for payments like Bitcoin did, or you can say for a number of different things that we're exploring. And, um, and uh, we think that the, the result is going to be leaner applications with, with new business models that, are, um, that, that bring cheaper products to consumers and, and will are, will be more resilient in the future and, um, uh, you know, really, it, it's unbundling really. I mean, it cycles and we're trying to, to uh, figure out how, how this is going to work. And Michael, what, did, what, did, what were the magic words that you had to say at the Wall Street Journal to get all the, the boring old men to, uh, to listen <laughs> to you about Bitcoin? Because, I, I mean, presumably, you're doing, you're doing online stuff about Bitcoin, but Hmm. What's it taking to get uh, to get Bitcoin on the front page of the journal? Well, sadly, sometimes sometimes it's 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 the drama and the you know the, they say that the, uh, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So I mean, Mount Gox got us on the front page, okay. and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know the arrest of Charlie Shrem and a few things like that. Uh, but but if you think of the drama of a rising price as well, so I mean, I think just if we start to roll this back, is what what got all the, got all the attention mm -hmm. in the first place? It certainly was the spectacular run up in the price back in December. So. You know, I, I personally think that was pretty clearly now a bubble, uh, but but it, it, it's it's interesting the role that that bubble played in perhaps taking Bitcoin to a new phase of awareness, um, and so I, I would say that's that's one of the, the key things. And then since then, you know, it's it's the arrival of, of names. It's 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 the sense that uh, you know. Dell Computer, uh, Expedia, and then Microsoft. I mean, I got a nice little scoop on the Sacramento Kings and, the, and their and their sign up, and that was mm -hmm. a that was kind of a fun one. Because oh my God, the MBA, the MBA is now getting in on this, right? So so uh, pe people get excited about that, uh, and I think then come along these these relatively large, uh, you know, increasingly large uh, funding rounds. So and, and, and again, the names are getting involved, and so. Once you hear about Mark Andreessen and, and uh, you know, then, and then, then we hear about the New York Stock Exchange or whether it's, it's um, you know, uh, the, the, the various other investors that have been there, including you guys, um, it, it starts to, to get a momentum, a sense that something real is happening. Um, and, and so I think that's just inherently what mainstream media latches onto. It's, it's something recognizable. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, an event on Wednesday uh, Larry Summers is speaking at it. You know, as a guy who um, has come out and said some fairly positive things about the prospect of this technology, and he's happy to talk to us as a, a event associated with the launch of our book on Wednesday at the Museum of American Finance, and that's the sort of stuff that gets people attention. It's like, wow, Larry Summers of all people is actually sort of recognizing that there's some some there there, and so I think more than anything, that's really what it is. It's it's, it's that the recognition that comes bit by bit uh, from you know, named people, people with a bit of gravitas. So I guess that's an interesting point, because so why don't we discuss a little bit about what it's going to take to legitimize the whole idea of Bitcoin. Does Bitcoin itself have to be legitimized? Does the technology, does the blockchain technology, is that the thing that we're, that's driving all this and that's, is that the 
back end for all this that we're all going to use for all sorts of purposes? Or is Bitcoin the important thing? Uh, well, I'll kick it off only because um, it, I think it's been an important part of what we've gone through in this publicity phase now because we've had a lot of, you know, quite a bit of media, people asking us the question. The question they always come back to us and say, well, you know, how, how could Bitcoin possibly work? It, it, it's, it's this volatile currency. We, <coughs> Mum and Papa are never going to want to use it to, to buy their groceries with something that changes 10% every, every day. And, and the way I've come back from that is that I think that the narrative has been wrong around Bitcoin from day one. Uh, nobody's really to blame for it. I mean, I think there's obviously the sense that this was a currency that would then, you know, take over the world. And there's a lot of enthusiasts who thought that it might, you know, bring the Fed to its knees. knees and, and that became the narrative. That's what everyone got obsessed about. When the price rose up through a thousand people, wow, maybe, maybe this is going to take over the world. And, and then once it fell, all the naysayers would come out and say, ha, 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 they were, how ridiculous all that was. And, and so we've sort of focused on this, on the currency aspect of it. And, and I know that Michael's going to have something to say about how important the currency actually is, and, and, I, and I still I thoroughly agree with that, that it's important. But I think that the narrative got a bit confused, and it really should have been a discussion about the technology, about the blockchain, about decentralization, about, about it as a platform and all the opportunities, and the fact that Bitcoin's a critical part of that and an important part. But if we'd started with that from, the, from day one, maybe we would have been having a very different conversation with the general public, and you're kind of a little bit behind the eight ball now and trying to trying to convince people that this is what we're talking about. But, th but it's shifting. I mean, it's certainly uh, coming out of Silicon Valley, that, that, that narrative, that conversation is now the predominant one. I think he here now in New York and, and certainly, you know, on the street, we're hearing that that's the interest in it. Um, and, then, and then it kind of goes around and we end up focusing on the currency again because that's the vehicle that you need to have to make this thing work and that's the means through which you, you sort of gain exposure and investment in this fabulous technology and what it might be. But it's a, it's a sort of a circular way to get there. All right, Joel, I mean, you guys focus primarily on the network effects and you, USV is interested in projects that can have a massive network effect based on number of users, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what are you guys looking at specifically? Right, so um, I, I completely agree that the narrative, uh, we got it wrong uh, starting out. Um, what we realized, and this might not be technically correct, we see the blockchain and Bitcoin as separate things, and we, we, we sort of see Bitcoin as the first killer application of the blockchain, and now we're looking for what are the other killer applications of the blockchain. And we, we started developing this thesis of the blockchain application stack where you have um, the blockchain as sort of the bedrock of the system. Then on top of it, you have decentralized data layers. On top of that, you, de you have decentralized protocols. On top of that, you have APIs. And on top of that, you have applications, right? And I'm talking about consumer applications, like for example, the monograph app demo that we saw, or the one name website that we saw that is sitting on top of, of these layers. And um, definitely, I mean, the focus was very much on, on the currency at the start, but now even we have been having conversations with people or, and companies who are looking to use the blockchain for things, for anything from education to telecommunications, weirdly. And, and it, it's been really interesting to see uh, people coming from very different backgrounds who learn about, about the blockchain and learn about this concept of a, of a, of a data store that is permanent, that, that cannot, be, you know, cannot be changed by anybody and where and where the, the user model is inverted, where the applications go to the user for the data as opposed to the, the, the users going to the application for the data, right? So when, when you use a Bitcoin wallet, the wallet is actually going to you, the holder of the keys, to get the information. And we believe that this is what will undo these, you know, these large networks that, that have popped up like Facebook and Twitter. And, um, and I think slowly people are, are starting to warm up to that, especially developers. Uh, but it's definitely in the early stages, and I, I like to say that we're in the protocol building phase, and, and then we will see more emerging successful protocols like Bitcoin, and then we will see applications on top. So for example, uh, for every new protocol that's coming up, you will have the coin base of that protocol. So you have decentralized identity, you will have the one killer application on top of that, but you will also have an ecosystem of, you know, there are many Bitcoin Coin wallets out there, and people can transact with each other. It doesn't matter if I use Coinbase or you use Circle. And similarly, the, for the opening protocol, it doesn't matter if you use one name or you use DNS chain or you use any other open name explorer. Uh, and so we believe that that's going to be the future, and people are starting to get the value of that. Michael? 
Yeah, I agree with these guys. I think we, um, the past year, 2014, the narrative around Bitcoin uh, was carried in a way that did not shine the most positive light on it. And I think it's you know up to people who are sitting up here and in this room to begin to evangelize and educate Bitcoin um, you know, to, to people who might not otherwise have any familiarity with it. And I think that the media, and definitely not the Wall Street Journal, but other media outlets, you know, took a really easy time writing a story about someone doing something nefarious with Bitcoin. It's far easier to write a story like that than it is to actually explain a brand new emerging technology that's really, really disruptive and really transformative. And the media, I think, took a lot of opportunities to do that over the past year. But, you know, now I think there's a strong emphasis on moving away from Bitcoin, the currency, and just looking at investment opportunities for companies who are leveraging the blockchain. Um, and while there are tons of companies doing great things uh, using blockchain technology, you know, the currency is kind of that fuel um, that allows a lot of this to occur. And I don't think that people should be so quick to give up on Bitcoin, the currency. Um, you know, I think over the last year, everything other than the price of Bitcoin has been going up and to the right. Um, the number of daily transactions, the number of companies accepting Bitcoin, the amount of human capital that's moving into the space. You have people leaving high paying jobs at banks and credit card companies and, you know, you name it uh, to go join Bitcoin companies. And when you have people like Larry Summers and Arthur Levitt and you know, people who have held these really esteemed positions in, in, in the government or in think tanks or whatever it may be coming out in support of Bitcoin, um, it just goes to show you that you know, everyone who is really taking the time to dig in uh, you know, comes out amazed and, and they just get that Bitcoin bug. Um, I think that going forward, um, we need to finally put to bed this idea about using Bitcoin for illicit activities. Um, and for accessing the deep web, which is you know, not an expertise of mine. Um, but I think that people who are, and there are several projects underway that are looking at AML and KYC and other ways uh, to let people get in and out of Bitcoin or on and off the Bitcoin highway and be able to securely um, identify themselves and where their funds are coming from and going to um, have a really, really large opportunity. Um, through my dialogues you know, with the Bitcoin Investment Trust and what we do, um, I spend most of my time with broker dealers and asset managers um, and I can tell you with 100% accuracy that every single bank on the street has a task force assigned to looking at Bitcoin, looking at the blockchain, um, trying to figure out how they're going to get involved. Are they looking at custodying? Are they looking at trading? Are they looking at investment products? Whatever it may be. Um, so I think that this year, I would have thought it would have happened earlier in 2014, um, but I really do think that moving into 2015, you're going to uh, continue to see more and more large, big, you know, what are usually slow to move institutions to really start embracing this change, because um, they're realizing that if they don't, um, they're going to be left behind, they're going to have to be playing catch up. Um, so yeah. So that's actually a good way to start. Why don't you, why don't you start with this? So what, what can we expect to see in the next two years, what, what's your, what's the, what do these next two years look like? The previous two years have been kind of Coinbase has kind of been the big fish. Uh, there's some investment happening in smaller companies. Not a lot of people quite understood it. Mt. Gox was sort of the, the focus of the news cycle for a long time. Uh, what's the focus for the next two years? Um, I think that for me, I think the lowest hanging fruit for Bitcoin still has to be remittances and payments. Um, and you're going to see, like, for example, a company today just raised another round called BitPesa, uh, based out of Kenya. And, you know, they're working with the population on the ground there to use Bitcoin um, as a remittance tool for their family members living in London, New York, and Boston. Um, and when you're looking, um, so I think that that's going to be like one of the first early cases is using Bit um, Bitcoin for remittance and payments. Um, I think that. From an investment perspective, um, you know, we're working on making a publicly available fund. Um, so I know that there's other efforts underway as well uh, to try and launch Bitcoin ETFs and other investment products. I think you'll begin to see the development of derivatives, um, Bitcoin options, Bitcoin futures. There's already several um, efforts underway as well. But just giving people more opportunities and more ways to access Bitcoin. 
And I think that you'll also start to see, you know, some of the other, because there are over 500 different digital currencies out there, some of them fully start to die out and start to see more people piling into Bitcoin and some of the other, you know, more well-known digital currencies. And that part of the ecosystem will start uh, to crystallize. Joel? And so um, I agree with, with Michael on the currency side. Um, you know, I, I think there, there are early signs of the cryptocurrency sort of uh, marketplace in terms of alternative currencies start consolidating over time, even with the price fluctuations of Bitcoin. And for the currency, definitely remittances and, and international uh, transfer of value and, and money uh, is, is definitely the low hanging fruit. Uh, for the blockchain, um, I think over the next two years we're going to see a surge of a, a similar surge of, of how we saw all the alternative altcoins or alternative cryptocurrencies rise in, in you know in the past two years. We're going to see a similar rise in in blockchain protocols that will later consolidate into a few winning protocols that do very specific uh, functions and really start getting adopted by applications. And uh, I think what's going to drive the adoption of this of these protocols is competition. So uh, one, you would wonder why, why an application developer would choose to use a decentralized protocol as opposed to centralize information into their own database and create data network effects and, and derive value, extract value from that. And it, that is certainly the traditional way to do it. And it, but now you, we have these data silos, which are you know, public companies with, with uh, lots of cash in the bank. and and exert a lot of power on their users and the startups will have to find a vector to compete and the vector to compete will be um, using these decentralized technologies to cut costs and, and have the ability to execute business models that undermine the incumbents business models in a way that the, 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 the incumbents can compete. So for example, you could have, um, you know, I can imagine an alternative YouTube where, where instead of YouTube taking you know whatever percent cut, 30 plus percent of, of the revenue that is shared with the artist, it's directly peer to peer, and and you know the advertising dollars go directly 100 percent to the artists, and the organization that creates this alternative YouTube maybe uses decentralized technologies like storage or or maybe something on top of BitTorrent to actually distribute the video and and create a. a, a a protocol or a network that is just as rel as reliable as YouTube, but you know requires a lot less capital and 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 has a lower cost structure, and therefore can figure out other ways to make money that do not involve taking cut on transactions. And and in that world, the consumer is better off, the artists and or the producers are better better off, and you know the incumbents can compete because going down there. Uh, Going, YouTube can't afford to have no take rate, for example. Or you can imagine a decentralized Uber, uh, where payments are peer to peer di directly, thanks to Bitcoin, and Uber can't compete because you know they have raised uh, enormous amounts of money and they have to return this money to the investors, and therefore you know can't operate at a 20% or 10% take rate or 5%. And we think that there's an opportunity there for for startups. The, the Uber one's an interesting <coughs> one. Uh, there's one. There's a company in, in um, Israel, in Tel Aviv, mm -hmm. called Lazuz, and uh, this idea of a community-based ride-sharing network and trying trying to find ways to monetize that sharing exercise is fascinating. I mean, it, it, it needs critical mass, and how they're going to build critical mass to make it work is going to be interesting. But it's just yet another example of the multiple ways in which this could go. You know, where it's headed, I think you need to think about what are the problems that need to be solved, right? So what are the problems in the real world, what are the problems within Bitcoin itself? Um, and so, you know, some of the stuff that, that um, the, the digital currency group are working on uh, in, in building out, you know, investment platforms, uh, some of the derivative products that are being developed, um, you know, some, some of the other mechanisms to try to grapple with the fun, what I see is the, one, of the, one of the many problems that Bitcoin still faces, and that is its volatility, and, you know, bringing liquidity to the marketplace, that's one of the problems that needs to be solved within Bitcoin. So there's going to be a lot of activity in that, in that area and, you know, the, the idea of new exchanges being built and exchanges that, that are built to uh, regulatory standards here in the US, you know, we certainly saw the news maybe watered down a little bit after it came out from Coinbase and uh, New York Stock Exchange. You know, the, the, this is where things are headed for that particular problem. But then out in the real world, it's interesting because I think that um, because of some of the challenges that are, that are, that are being faced uh, with you know, Bitcoin as a monetary transmission mechanism in the United States, whether it's 
that yeah. volatility problem, but also you know the constant battle of, of regulation. You know, you might find that, that 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 some of the use cases that it goes toward are ones where that friction doesn't exist as much. And you guys have both met, mentioned remittances and the unbanked, and you know, it seems to me that that's again low hanging fruit. It's, it, it, but the question is, how does it take place? And, and, and what I'm seeing is, you know, there's an enormous amount of interest right now on, on a global level, at a governmental and a non-governmental level, in solving the problem of financial inclusion. So you've got the Gates Foundation, you have the World Bank, you have a lot of governments now, there's a thing called the Mayan Declaration signed by 50 developing countries, all focused on this problem of financial inclusion. So the extent to which the cryptocurrency world can insert itself into that conversation and, uh, you know, find willing governments, for example, I think Mexico is my pet, uh, pro, pet project, but I really think Mexico, for, for a whole range of reasons, could be a very interesting test case for using blockchain as a form of uh, improving democratic governance in, in, in a country that has problems between the state and the peripheral uh, municip municipal governments. Those sorts of countries may well come on board and start embracing this. And then you suddenly get this, this, this you know, a country like Mexico is a very important developing nation. If they were to embrace it, you get you get this sort of big network effect start to happen. Uh, so that's the thing that I think to keep your eye on. I'm not predicting anything I don't know in particular, but I think mm -hmm. in terms of remittances and, and the whole problem of the unbanked, what happens in terms of developing uh, digital identities, for example, resolving some of the, the, the big friction problems that have existed within financial inclusion is going to be critical. But then, but then all, there's all these applications we've seen tonight, and I think, again, because they don't necessarily confront the same problems that you do at a money transmission level may have a, a better opportunity to sort of really move out there, whether it's the, the uh, decentralized Uber or, or something like Storage or One Name or, or you know, uh, Monograph. I mean, these are, these are very exciting opportunities. And, so you know, real quick before you cut us off, you want to cut us off? No. That's all right. So <laughs> we're, all, it's, we're all talkers, apparently. Uh, <laughs> the give me, let me, let's do a rapid fire thing. Uh, just maybe one sentence of explanation, not too much, and assuming all things being equal, that we're basically using some sort of blockchain technology, some sort of Bitcoin technology. When are these things going to happen? Give me a year. Uh, when am I going to be able to go to the Wall Street Journal and, or any piece of media and buy a story uh, for Satoshi? And you guys can all answer. Which, which year? I think you can you can do that now. Yeah, you could do it now. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. 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 I know. You could do it, you could do it now. Yeah. There's a lot of this. We can say we got a debit card or whatever. Right, right, right. But I think Correct. the uh, the Chicago Trib did it. But um, uh, well, the Journal, I'm um, five years. Uh, yeah. So which is optimistic, I think. Anyway. For the Wall Street Journal. People Magazine, whatever, it doesn't matter. TechCrunch. Financial Times. Yeah. Um, two years. Two years. I'd say two years. Yeah, I'm gonna say two to three years. All right, when, when am I going to be able to go to the bodega and just uh, wave my phone at, at, at some machine that's going to get me a Snickers bar? Wave your phone. Whatever, or some, whatever, some future device that's embedded in my head. Or well, we have Bitcoin <laughs> debit cards now. so Not yeah. debit cards. We're not talking about debit because that's old stuff, right? right? We're talking about new stuff. I think p potentially you could be doing it at, at, at a bodega mm -hmm. uh, somewhere you know, within the next general, few months, right? Accepted, but if it's yeah. widely accepted, I don't know, two years? Not in the next 10 years. Okay. No, I think it's sooner than that. I mean, when you're starting to see integration with PayPal and, um, you know, other payment platforms <coughs> and the advent of Apple Pay and this whole idea of point of sale and having your wallet in your phone, um, I think it'll be in the next five years. All right. And finally, what, what about uh, McDonald's? When's that going to happen? <laughs> Not, no no debit cards, no, no. No, no singing and dancing, hugging your loved ones before you go further. <laughs> I, look, I think a lot of these guys are going to take it on as an option, mm -hmm. and, and so therefore I, I don't really see a problem in saying somewhere between two to five. The, the bigger question to me is like, how widespread is the adoption going to be? And I just mm -hmm. I don't see that being something that the average person is going to be using a lot of in a hurry. And so I'm thinking about the like Bitcoin. Um, that's you know McDonald's, big chain. I'd probably say five years, maybe. Okay. So you guys are optimistic pessimists. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing is that the, what, the reason why for the previous uh, question I said not in the next 10 years is that I don't think uh, Bitcoin, I don't think the primary use case for Bitcoin in the network as a whole is going to be common currency. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm more excited about uh, the idea of programmable money and machines paying each other for for you know, small amounts of money for certain transactions. All right.
So we have about uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. All right, let's go for a question. Sorry to, uh, that's a lot of questions, so sorry. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, I'm a hospitality professor. I'm just curious what, how you think the blockchain will impact higher education? <coughs> Um, well, so I, I met uh, a, a couple of months ago with, a, with the CEO of a company who was building education software and he builds, um, you know, like content management systems for schools and universities and the reason why he was very interested in the blockchain is because he's, he sees this problem of, of data portability when it comes to um, you know, a student moves through the school system and moves through schools and moves through, you know, from preschool to, you know, middle school, high school, university, and so on and so forth. And you're always sort of moving this data around grades and, you know, reports and, and, and all of that. And he was really excited about the blockchain because he saw the opportunity to create a protocol where, you know, you can put grades in there, you can put um, certificates in there, you can put uh, diplomas in there, and it moves, uh, and it, it stays with the user, it stays with the student as he, you know, moves through the system, moves through the world. Uh, I actually think that's a really interesting idea because it is a problem that, you know, we have all faced. Imagine, we all remember what it was like to get transcripts from school, so just to go to a university and the, and, and the whole pain that it was and getting it stamped and then sending it through the mail and, and you know, that, I think that's a very big opportunity for, for blockchain technologies where you could have a school signing uh, with their, you know, with their open name profile or, or whatever other system signing that, yes, this student passed this grade or, or he got this score in math and then, and the other parties have instant access to this information, but it also stays with the, with the, with the, uh, with the student. I mean, I've, I've lost all my transcripts and if my high school caught fire, I'm sure I could never get those again, so. Uh, I think that that's that's how it would impact higher education, or education in general. Another uh, question over here. The panelists made a good distinction in terms of the blockchain versus Bitcoin itself, with Bitcoin essentially being the first killer app for the blockchain. And putting aside the value of remittances or other payment systems, as the blockchain is used for all these other applications, like we heard tonight in terms of <coughs> identity or art or education or whatever the case might be, do, do those use cases, as they build, increase the value of a Bitcoin? Are they irrelevant? Does Bitcoin eventually go to zero at some point in the distant future? Just curious to know the relationship between the price of a Bitcoin and the use of the blockchain technology itself in the, in the line of panels. Do you want to take that? Sure. Um, I, I think, again, this is very subjective, but I think that the value will increase. I think when you start looking at people utilizing tokens to represent various things, um, whether they use Bitcoin or other side chains or other altcoins, um, that if there is enough use of them, the, the value is, is going to go up. Um, as with all of these, there's a scarcity value to them. So as they get used more and more inherently, it's kind of a classic supply and demand case um, where if there's fewer of them and the demand goes up, you know, then inherently the price is going to go up. Um, other people will probably tell you the exact opposite, that you know, off of Blockstream and some of these other things that are being built off on side chains, um, that, that you know, Bitcoin could very easily go to zero, which could. It really does depend on, uh, on you know, whether it be Bitcoin. I mean, it becomes the, 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 the sort of basic blockchain for everything. Um, but it, I mean, just things. Again, Joe, you might want to wait. But Ethereum, it seems to me, you know, has built this this model where uh, the, you know, the ether, the, the the core currency, is is critical to so many of the software applications you know, that, that that have to be built. And you can't build them without building multiple uh, transactions through through those software applications. And so. To, to be a participant, to be an app developer with on that on that system, you have to first get yourself a whole lot of ether uh, to then and to continue continue doing so. So, you know, I presume it's the same way it works across you know blockchain applications for Bitcoin and everything else. The app developers, any of these these participants, there's all sorts of ways in which you're going to still need the core coin as part of what you're doing. Uh, and let's not forget that a lot of the the uh, on the blockchain applications that are being built are actually for money and asset transfers, right? So there's a lot of value that's still gonna be transferred, whether it's digitalized assets, you know, gold-backed Bitcoin uh, uh, contracts, and all sorts of things like that, which are gonna require 
that, that value is being contained within it, and that I think inherently means. Yeah, or even like using real real time settlements for for stock transactions, things like replacing ACH and DTC and what our friends at Ripple are doing, trying to kind of integrate all these back office systems that are seemingly antiquated and don't really speak to one another, um, you're still going to need a mechanism to transfer those assets and, and represent their value. So we have, we have another question back here. Uh, sort of a newbie to this Bitcoin uh, for a new bus, but the Bitcoin ticker app. And the last news item we have is uh, Hong Kong's MyCoin disappears <laughs> with up to $387 million. And they say it's some kind of a Ponzi scheme. Um, do you see this, uh, how do you see this affecting you know, future people like, that don't even know about Bitcoin? Is it? Maybe an article like this. There's, there's, I mean, it's just a critical problem. I mean, to, 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 to sort of put your head in the sand and say that security is not a problem because Bitcoin itself can't be hacked, or, or to say, well, look, Home Depot got hacked and Target got hacked, I think the Bitcoin community is, is, is naive to imagine that this is not a problem, right? So these stories come out all the time. Now, admittedly, it's my coin. I don't even know what my coin is. It's a, you know, there, there's all sorts of very poorly secured altcoins that have been created by pump and dump schemes that you know ultimately they go away. But the association in the general public's mind is that it's the same thing. And, and, and that's a problem. That, 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 that message needs to be managed. And it's not managed just because it's not just PR. And of course, there is a PR problem because there's no sort of central marketing agency to manage the PR. But, it, but uh, it's also about the facts. So as much as it, it, it is an impressive fact that it is virtually impossible to hack Bitcoin itself and that that's a very important quality of the blockchain, people's wallets can get hacked and people's wallets getting hacked is a serious problem for people. So, so solving that security problem is a, is a key challenge. But what I suppose the, the flip side good news is, is a lot of activity. This is an open source project that is bringing the best minds in encryption to the problem. I think the development of, of uh, you know, multi-sig wallets and some of the standards that are being built around the enterprise products. I mean, it was just remarkable that Bitstamp was, was not using the, the, the high-end multi-sig wallets that it could have had to get hacked recently. It's ridiculous, because these, these products are actually out there for them to use. It's also important to understand that the pump and dump is a proud Wall Street tradition. Uh, right. been around for <laughs> decades. And it's something, it's something that they love to do. And uh, they're bringing that to a new world now, which, right. is, which is excellent. It's, it's, it's good to see the old <laughs> flowing into the new. <laughs> yeah. It just gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling, doesn't it? You know? On a brighter note, maybe, is it a bright question or a question? All right. So right now it's painfully obnoxious to buy Bitcoin with credit card. If and when that there's an easy solution for the average show to buy into the Bitcoin world with their credit card, how do you think that would affect the ecosystem and specifically how do you think that would affect liquidity? So um, there are a couple <coughs> of companies that let you buy Bitcoin with a credit card. The problem with buy doing that is that uh, there's a lot of risk. So, um, you know, you can, for example, get a chargeback or issue a chargeback and then, you know, they already gave you the Bitcoin, they can't take it back. And therefore, you know, the company, whoever offers to, to sell you Bitcoin in exchange for a credit card payment is taking on a huge risk. So typically these companies will charge you up to 60% markup over the market price of Bitcoin just because the, 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 the risk is that high and the fraud levels are that high. Now. No, I don't. I don't think uh, it, it is. A, I mean, if you have a credit card, you have a bank. You probably have a checking account. Uh, you log on to Coinbase right now. Or you you create an account. You link your bank account, and it's fairly easy. It's as easy as you know connecting your bank account to Venmo. And you can also connect your credit card to to Coinbase, and they will give you a limit for instant buys. And you know you can buy up to three thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, and it'll pull it from your credit or debit card and it'll show up in your account instantly. And for larger transactions, it'll just pull it from, from, from your bank account using ACH, and that's where it takes you know, a number of days to clear. Um, but also interesting, and, and sorry I'm staying with Coinbase, is you know, the release of uh, USD wallets, which allow you to have a, a USD balance, a USD denominated wallet in, in your Coinbase account, and in the future you'll be able to have a Euro denominated wallet 
and from in transfer for, transfers from your USD wallet to your to your Bitcoin wallet and, and back and forth are instant and you know uh, don't have to go through that system through the uh, regular financial system. So um, you know it, it it is true that it used to be really hard to buy Bitcoin. You didn't have to sign up with an exchange and all of this. But the, what's happening is um, you know Coinbase has made it really easy and opening up their developer for, uh, platform is making it easy for other applications to integrate buy and sell uh, by using you know customers existing Coinbase accounts. So for example, uh, Hedgeable, as the demo showed, they just connect to your to your Coinbase and and then they don't have to deal with 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 all the aspects of enabling that functionality. Great. So unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. Remember to buy Michael's book. Yes. Remember so to buy it's the available book. and like you can buy it for Litecoin. What's the you can, you can't buy for like, you can buy it for Bitcoin on Overstock, right. um, and then you know buy it with the other boring old fiat currency. Uh, right. Walk over Amazon. the and like I did. There you go. Yeah, boring ways. Traditional. To buy it. Yeah. Unfortunately. So uh, round of applause to everybody who. Uh,